Welcome to Fruity Knitting, I'm Andrea and today I have a special guest joining me, Natasha Hornby. <laughs> Natasha has travelled down from Amsterdam and she's been staying with us for a few days and Madeline has temporarily given up her seat on the Fruity Knitting couch so Natasha can join us as our very special guest. <laughs> Thank you for that lovely introduction, uh, Andrea. Uh, I feel Fruity Knitting has been a large part of my career for a long time because this is the third time I appear on the show and three times it really is a charm. I'm on the couch. <laughs> How cool is that? <laughs> it's very cool. I'm honored. It's actually been a heap of fun having you come and stay with us and I've so enjoyed our talks every evening. It's been great. As did I. Good. So quickly for new viewers, Fruity Knitting is a 90-minute program bringing you knitting inspiration from around the world as well as extra snippets on travel, history and storytelling that we hope adds joy to your life and brings a smile to your face. Now, Natasha here is one of my new favourite knitwear designers because her designs are sophisticated, elegant and very exciting. I think she's extremely talented and I'm thrilled that you're going to get to know her better through this episode. So earlier this year, in June... Madeline and I travelled up to Amsterdam to interview Natasha and that was before we crossed over on the ferry to the UK to do our month of interviews there. So that interview is included in today's program and there we talk about Natasha's background studies in fashion and textiles and we show you and talk through several of her garment and shawl designs. Also, if you follow Natasha on Instagram, you'll know she has an extremely stylish account. <laughs> Her beautiful photos really capture and show off her designs in very creative moods. And Natasha teaches several knitting workshops, but one of her favourite workshops to teach is on knitwear-related photography. So today, she's also going to share with you some of her tips and tricks on how to photograph your knitwear. Exactly, and I would be so happy to do so, because I think a lot of us knitters like to share our work with other knitters, don't we? Um, and although there are millions of us worldwide, we don't all have like knitting buddies in our immediate environment. Yeah. So we turn to Facebook, to Ravelry, to Instagram. And of course, that is different from a live knitting circle. But I think if life is out of the question, it's a perfect way to connect with like-minded souls. And nothing beats touching and feeling a knit in real life. But when that is out of the question, I think imagery can play a huge, a crucial role. Because I think, for instance, my designs would never have been seen, let alone knitted by someone from Korea, Japan, the United States, if it wasn't for those platforms and the photography. So that is why I love helping people up there game in knitwear photography, because it's a way to communicate, to share, and to really be one within, the, within this beautiful community of ours. Yeah, that's going to be a really fun segment, so you'll definitely learn some good things there. Also included in today's program, we take you to New Brunswick in Canada for a short feature on the Legacy Lane Fibre Mill. So the owners of Legacy Lane are two sisters, Alison and Amy. And they come from a fourth generation farming family and together they wanted to find a way to keep their family farm viable. So after farming alpacas, they diversified into a fiber processing and yarn production business, including starting up their own spinning mill and their own weaving and knitting workshop. So Alison and Amy are two competent and interesting women and with the support of their husbands and their parents they've really built up a fantastic business so you'll enjoy meeting them as well. That's the summary of today's program and now we'll get straight into bring and brag with your latest shawl. Yay! <laughs> I brought a shawl indeed or actually I brought two to brag about and these, this is one of my great mosaic shawls. I call them great, great or grand mosaics because I always try to expand on the technique. I um, design one of these every year and it's in the line of my Lune, my Man and my Yara shawl, for instance. This one is very, very close to my heart, not only because I'm, I use the novel technique, but also because it was... a a joint venture with the woman who taught me how to knit, also known as Mum. <laughs> so I named the shawl after her. It's called Yvonne MT, short for Yvonne Maria Theresia. Which is an extremely elegant name. <laughs> 
Um, it's an asymmetric triangle, as you can see. So you will start the shawl over there with mm -hmm. just a few stitches. I think it's about three or five. And then you work your way in regular mosaic down to here until that border pattern is complete. And then the novel technique comes in. And the technique is, I call, intarsia light. And it's intarsia because you change colors halfway a row and it's light because it doesn't have any of the challenge of full-on hardcore intarsia. So it's easy? Super easy. Good. <laughs> okay. How it has worked is that an ordinary mosaic, you work two, two rows in one color. So row one and two, you work in color A. Row three and four, you work in color B. Row five and six, color A again, and so on and so on. And with this one, I chose a third color for the inner body of the shawl. And to get this effect, you do the intarsia light over here, which means you will start with the third color, work up to the border pattern, then change to border, border pattern color, work down, then border pattern color, change to the third color again, and that uh, two rows are finished. The next two rows are worked in one color only. So that is what makes it really, really easy. Yeah. If you're anything like me, and I think most are knitters okay. are. Yes. We want to see the back side. Of course. <laughs> and although I'm not a super neat knitter, I'm sorry to say, you can see the change over here from border to inner body yeah. is definitely quite neat. And you get that by twisting the yarns when you make the color change, just to, as you would with the normal stranded knitting. You can also see mosaic color work has, as a lot of other color work, stranded knitting, slip stitch color work, has floats on the back side. And um, I like uh, these floats to go uh, to to become one with the fabric over time by wearing and washing so to felt in with it a bit a, a bit yeah. yeah it's not really like felt but they become yeah more one with the fabric and the way to get that is to choose a uh, hundred percent wool that is not super washed because that will felt in with the with the fabric nicely if you chose a super wash yarn your floats will be floaty until the end of time. <laughs> will not. And you'll be catching your rings in them until exactly. the end of time. Yeah. So this is what the back looks like. Uh, looks like. And um, as you can see for what? colors, yeah. and especially because this is a, uh, a garter stitch mosaic, you can do a stockinette mosaic, but this design is garter stitch all over, no purling, every row knit. So that also makes it quite easy. And you can see the garter stitch mosaic is really textural. Mm. So when you choose your colors, I always recommend to have high contrast colors for your mosaic. Because if you don't and you have a lower contrast, which can be beautiful in, a, for instance, flat stockinette, yeah. um, all the patterning will get lost in all of that texture. So choose high contrast colors for your mosaic. And you can see... Actually, this, the inner bodies, also worked in a very simple mosaic. And I deliberately chose a lower contrast for that inner body so that border would pop. Mm. So lower contrast here to get this more to the background and the higher contrast is worked here. And this has a bit of a tweedy look, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. yeah, because the one of the border colors is also worked in here. So you get that nice tweedy, but you don't want this to look tweedy. No, you want this no, to yeah. be there, you know. So what yarn is this then? This is Jameson of Shetland Spindrift. It's a fingering weight and it comes in a gazillion colors. Yes, it does. And I work this shawl on needle 3.5. Normally for a stockinette sweater, you would, would probably work it on, on, on a 3.25 or yeah. something. But you want some drape to the shawl, so a little little larger needle than you would do for stockinette. Okay, now it's got a gorgeous edge on it, so say something about yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> this is where I felt really clever. <laughs> um, this is nice and scalloped, and because you work like this, this is done by increasing and decreasing. And you can see that 
um, also with the scallops over here, you're not cutting into that diamond pattern nowhere. So I, I really love that idea, but then I got to the edge and I thought, oh, it would be such a shame to go cutting in it now, yeah. to just cut it off here, bluntly. So I thought of these two little peaks, uh, <laughs> peaks <Humps>. over here. <laughs> felt very, very clever. And that also helps to keep the whole patterning intact and it gives some movement to the whole shawl and the edging. Yeah, it's really stunning. Yeah. A gorgeous color combination as usual with you. Oh, thank you. But if you, I can understand if people don't want to do the whole intarsia light thing, even if it's light. <laughs> and I think the shawl is just as striking work, worked in two colors. And this yeah. is where my mom came in. She uh, made this one. And this is, here you also can see that also the inner border is worked in uh, mosaic all over, very simple. And she worked it in uh, Bichet Bush. Petit lamb's wool, which is a little bit lighter even than the, the spin yeah. rift, yeah. And uh, but she worked it on the same needle, and it has exactly the same gauge, and therefore it's even more drapey than yeah. uh, mine is. It's um, beautiful. Yeah, it's nice, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And both the two and the three color version are described in the pattern, and the pattern's coming out. I think when are the testers finished? It will be mid December or something. And judging, speaking about testers, I have the most um, amazing testing crew of the whole universe. <laughs> and <laughs> I think <clears throat> 15 or so people um, uh, knitted this shawl, tested this shawl. And that, judging from that, I can see it's super versatile. Yeah. Because everybody made it to, into their own. You've got moody, bright, um, happy ones, and also very colorful ones. And, and pastel soft. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's very uh, easy to adapt to your own taste and your own style. And I, for one, like to see a lot more of that. So I hope some of you are into <laughs> knitting this. And someone knitted it with four colors, yes, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. She did the inner diamonds all in another color. Okay. So she used hardcore in Yeah, that is hardcore. <laughs> yeah. Okay. What is nice also okay. about um, uh, an asymmetric triangle is that it is really easy to wear. Yes, I don't wear shawls, so, so why don't I'm, you give me a lesson? Yeah, I'm going <laughs> to give you a lesson. <laughs> See if we can manage this yeah, on camera. Sit close together. Okay. If you have the asymmetric triangle, you yeah. take the short end. Yeah. If you want to wear the point, I always wear the point at front. Some people at back, but I do it at the front. You take the short end, Yeah. you drape it around your neck. Make sure that this is long enough on this side. Okay. Otherwise, it will fall off. Yeah. Then you take this. And you just wrap the whole thing around. And oh, if you want good. to show the, off the border, yeah. you tuck it under. Tuck this one underneath here. Okay, I think I'm managing so, this. Yeah. <laughs> then you do your hair nicely. Yeah. And and voila. Voila. Uh, How am I looking? Almost. Almost, almost okay. <laughs> almost okay. Beautiful. I need you as my stylist. Okay, so there you go. <laughs> Natasha's latest shawl. And what's it called? Yvonne MT. Of course, you said you. that. <laughs> <laughs> My mum. Of course, the mum. So there we go. <laughs> so we're continuing in Bring and Brag. Back in episode 118, we interviewed the UK's premier toy designer, Alan Dart. And Alan has been designing toys for the Women's Weekly and Simply Knitting magazines for over 30 years. And when we released that interview, we also started an Alan Dart knit along. And I have been saying for a very long time now that I really want to knit up one of his designs. I finally have, and here it is. It's the nest of birds. It's so cute. <laughs> Looking super, super cute. So Alan doesn't like his toys to look like shapeless baby toys. So he always puts in a lot of extra shaping and details into the patterns, which I think makes them so much more appealing. They really look like beautiful decorations that you can put in corners of your house as happy little surprises. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow, look at that. <laughs> and uh, Or obviously you can give them away as gifts for friends. But having said that... This nest of birds isn't going anywhere because it's just too cute and I can't part with it. I wouldn't give this away. No. No. <laughs> 
Alan has well over 200 toy designs in many different categories, including prehistoric animals, monsters, nativity scenes, collections of bears and mice, and even a knitted chess set. Wow. <laughs> And you can spend hours looking through his portfolio, but my favourite ones are the toys designed on the animals in the Cumbrian landscape where he lives. So this here is a nest of great tits. She's the great tit and these are the little baby ones. Baby tits. Yeah, <laughs> baby tits. <laughs> okay, the pattern is, this was actually a surprisingly quick knit and the pattern was extremely clearly written. If when you read through the pattern, you don't understand the construction. Don't worry about it. All you need to do is start with the very first step and then faithfully follow along each step and it gets much, much clearer as you go along. So we'll take out the baby chicks so I can show you the nest. You can hold the chickies. The nest, you start with the nest and it's knitted in a chunky tweed yarn. There's two layers to the nest and you stuff the layers or in between the layers with some toy stuffing and that just helps to keep it erect and to make it nice and soft and cushy. You can see inside the inner lining is done in stocking stitch and that's just to make it nice and smooth like a real nest is. And on the outside it's reverse stocking stitch and then you embroider long straight stitches in a slightly darker thinner yarn and that's to resemble twigs. You used multiple colours, didn't you? I did. I did. I got a little bit more fancy. <laughs> I was trying to be more realistic. So that that's the nest, and that was fairly easy to do. Next, I started on the baby chicks. So I'll give you this. Give you me the nest. Again. You get yeah, the chick. Here's a chick. So, and here I began to doubt the pattern and do my own modifications, as I am known to do. <laughs> I was really convinced that my baby chick wouldn't be tall enough and you wouldn't see it over the edge of the nest. So I added in extra rows in the body. That was a really big mistake because this is the correct size chick and this is my modified version. And if I had knitted three of these, they wouldn't have fitted into the nest and they would have been way too intimidating and the mother bird would never have feed them. <laughs> They're almost as big as her. Oh. So what I've got in the end is four baby chicks. And Madeline calls this one the cuckoo. Yeah, I heard her say that. <laughs> because as you know, cuckoos don't raise their own young. They lay their eggs in the nests of other birds who raise the, the chick as their own. So that's very sneaky. Yeah, parenting. and sometimes the, 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 the actual chicks are going to die in that process because the cuckoo has a much larger beak. So the mother will be inclined to fill that beak all the time and not the smaller beaks of the... Of the original. <laughs> That's so sad. It is. <laughs> That's amazing that the evolution has got away with doing that. Yeah, well, we need cuckoos probably for something. For, for cuckoo clocks. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but actually what I most enjoyed was knitting the, the mother teat bird because she has the most details and shaping, so she was the most interesting to knit. So I'm going to show you some close-up pictures of her. So I used some leftover Alice Darmore yarn for the back feathers. This yarn is dyed in the fleece and then different colours are carded together to produce a heathered yarn. So you see the flecks of different colours in the light, just like you would on a real bird's back. The upper parts of the wings are in stocking stitch and they're sewn flat against the body and the ends of the wings are in ribs, so they look like long wing feathers. And the tail is also really interesting. It's knitted sideways in garter stitch and that creates a little ridge right at the tip. Also, Alan has ingenious ways of making the stiff little body parts like the beak and the feet, which believe it or not, are also knitted. So each foot is knitted in one piece by casting on and then immediately casting off on the following row. And you do that four times to create four little claws, which you then tightly wrap to make stiff like a bird's foot. The eyes are all embroidered using a very tiny black chain stitch with little white straight stitches in the center of each eye for gloss. And I much prefer embroidered eyes than toy glass eyes. And lastly, I just love the little piece of yarn in the bird's mouth, in the beak, just to resemble a, a worm. I think it looks very realistic. <laughs> yeah, it's so lovely. And this is great for all those leftovers, isn't it? Totally, yes. A bit fiddly, maybe. Yeah, definitely fiddly. <laughs> so Alan recommends hairspraying his finished toys. 
And that's because originally, when he first started sending off his toys to the magazines to be photographed, they were being played with before being photographed. That's such a funny imagery. You can imagine all the people in the studio having a little play <laughs> before getting down to work. And then, of course, the, the toys were losing their shape and they ended up looking all wrong in the photos. And naturally, this really upset Alan. So he started to spray his toys before sending them off to the magazines. And now he recommends to do it in the pattern. Well, I sprayed my birds and I think it actually works really well. Because, for instance, uh, with the mother bird's tail here, uh, as I said, it's knitted sideways in garter stitch. And my cast off row, which was on this side, was slightly tighter than my cast on row. And so the tail was always kind of a bit wonky and leaning to the side. So giving it a good spray straightened it out. It's a bit like blocking, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. But just don't no. spray your garments. <laughs> <laughs> and then also with the beaks. If you have, where's, where's, where's the, the, the cuckoo? The cuckoo. Uh, oh, I think, it? yeah, I yeah. have it here. So yeah. I didn't spray the cuckoo's beak, and you can see how the beak's sort of curling a little bit, whereas these chicks, they've all been sprayed and their beaks are nice and stiff. So that works really well. Even spraying the nest was a good idea because it helped it stay more erect. And before I sprayed the nest, the weight of the mother bird was kind of making one side of the nest droop a little bit, and then she was swaying around looking slightly drunken, which was not a good thing. So after a spray, she's sober again. And it's all looking good. How is she standing on the oh, edge? Yeah, she's got a little piece of Velcro between her, her feet there, so she stays perched. Cool. So overall, I would say I don't have a natural affinity for knitting toys, mainly because you just have to do a whole lot of little bits and pieces, and I really enjoy the rhythm of long stretches of knitting. I think you do too, Yes, don't you? I do too. Yeah. Yes. That's why I said maybe a bit fiddly. Yeah, definitely. But having said that, I've since bought two new patterns from Alan Dart because they're so adorable, and I'm going to knit them up and give them away as Christmas presents. If dragon fever doesn't take over me. <laughs> dragon sickness. Let's see about that. Yeah. Okay. So now it's time to take a short break. We're going to stretch our legs and go to the Ordenwald and do some extreme knitting. And Natasha's coming with us. Yeah. <laughs> Straight after that, we're going to go to, we'll take you to New Brunswick in Canada to meet Amy and Alison from the Legacy Lane Fiber Mill.
bottle. Maybe you should oh, like bring a bottle of whiskey to all your interviews and make people have a, a oh. toddy beforehand. Hi, my name is Allison Brown and I'm Amy Carpenter Tawny. We are sisters and we co-own Legacy Lane Fiber Mill as well as Legacy Lane Yarn and Gift Shop. The mill was founded in 2005 and the yarn shop in 2019. Amy and I grew up in a farming family. Uh, our family has been farming for generations. We felt like we wanted to diversify from the traditional farming our family had been doing. So we thought maybe we would farm alpacas. I was going to the New Brunswick College of Craft and Design at the time and would graduate with a diploma in textiles. And Amy was also graduating that same year with a diploma in business. We started researching alpaca farming and it quickly became evident that there was more a need for fiber processing facility than there was for another alpaca farm. So we switched gears completely and really started researching and writing a business plan for a mill. Our parents have been our biggest supporters and our biggest fans from day one and are still involved in our operations on a day-to-day -day basis. After we opened the mill, we had an opportunity to manage a herd of 70 alpacas. Um, so along with our parents and husbands, we did that for three years. But the mill was becoming more and more busy, and we really wanted to expand our services and what we could offer our clients. So we changed management hands uh, and really dove deep into our milling and expanding our services to our clients. Right. So we are a full fiber processing facility located in Sussex, New Brunswick, Canada. Along with Milling Natural Fibers, we also operate a weaving and knitting studio. We've really worked on building our business from fiber to finish. Um, we have fiber producers from all across Canada down into the U.S., one of the strengths of our business is our ability to help our clients figure out what the best end product is for their fiber type or their fiber, fiber harvest. The yarn part, uh, the saddle part or the blanket is where the yarn is made from. It is the softest and has the most consistent staple length while the seconds are shorter and more coarse and are more suited for felt products. Felt products like dryer balls and insoles. The dryer balls and the insoles are blended, much like yarn is blended, with a domestic sheep's wool that we source from another local mill, and it acts like a glue to hold all the fibers together. In addition to the wool, we also add hemp to our insoles, which gives it strength and durability. So some of the blanket fiber we often receive in the mill is what we refer to as different grades. So this is a very typical and common grade. It's a grade five, which is about a 28 to 29 micron fleece. It has quite a presence of guard hair and also doesn't have a whole lot of crimp within the fleece. So this fleece is what we would actually recommend our clients make maybe into a sock yarn, something that wouldn't be worn next to the skin. We would always recommend at least a 30% merino to help hold the fibers all together and act, give it some memory. As well, we would recommend that they put in at least 15% nylon to give it strength. This sock yarn is spun at a higher twist and blended into a three-ply yarn, which will also help with the long-term wearability of it. The next example I'd like to show, which is one of our most favorites to work with, and it's quite often a lot of what we receive, is what we refer to as a grade three, a 23 to 26 micron fleece. It has very little guard hair, it still has a lovely crimp in it, and a very soft handle. So quite often we would make worsted weight yarns out of this. This is an example of a worsted weight yarn. We would recommend that the client use a minimum of 20% merino to help give it that memory and elasticity. And also in this case, we've blended with 10% bamboo, which gives it strength, but also a really beautiful icy sheen. This has been spun into a worsted weight yarn and is still very soft. So it could be worn next to the skin in sweaters, scarves, cowls, and hats. And the third example that I'd like to show is a Crea fiber. And Crea comes from a baby alpaca. And quite often, Crea fiber is extremely tender and very fine. It also has 
often a presence of a broken, discolored tip. So when we go to process this, this tip can break off very easily. And it we attempted to spin it into a standard yarn, it would cause slubbing in the yarn. So oftentimes, because of the tenderness, as well as the very long staple, we will recommend that our clients make a lopy yarn from this fiber. We still recommend a 20% merino blend to help hold the slippery crea fibers all together. It is a chunky yarn, which makes it a quick knit, but it's also very soft so it can be worn next to the skin. Over the last few years, we, aside from providing services to fleece producers, we have focused on creating our own yarns, our own blends um, under our Legacy Lane brand. Our best-selling yarn and one of our personal favorites is our Kitchen Sink Lopi. The Kitchen Sink Lopi was invented kind of by accident. We were looking for a way to use up leftover fibers that we used in all of our yarn production. And so that's kind of where it got its name because our yarn production included so many different fibers, everything from alpaca to merino to bamboo, even a bit of silk. So everything is thrown in to this, uh, to this yarn. It, so aside from all the random fibers, we also use a multitude of colors that are dyed in the wool. It is again, a lopy style yarn. So it is a quick and a fun knit. And also when you're working with it, you never know exactly how the colors are going to play out in the finished piece, which again, really speaks to the fun of the yarn. One of a kind skein for sure. Um, a signature yarn of ours that I want to share with you is our alpaca merino cashmere yarn. This, as Amy mentioned, alpaca comes in 22 natural colors. So here's a few of the natural colors of the fleece that, that we see in the mill. Um, this is its dyed state. So we have a variety of dyed colors as well that we do. And this yarn, we often spin into a worsted weight, just a really super versatile yarn. We blend with 20% merino, 10% cashmere to give it that full rounded bodied yarn, beautiful stitch definition and cable and textured knits. And it's just a really squishy, fun yarn. And then the next yarn that we're super excited to share with you guys is our sock yarn. So we spent a lot of time experimenting with this yarn. It is a 50% merino, 25% alpaca, 15% EcoFi, and 10% cashmere. And EcoFi is actually recycled pop bottles. So pop bottles are shredded down and basically put into this fiber form. So it's super strong and that was what really drew us to putting it into a sock yarn. So we experimented with the blend wanting to not jeopardize the softness of the alpaca and the merino and also not to negatively affect the dyeing process because it being a synthetic fiber it doesn't accept the dye like the protein fibers do. So here you can see it's dying beautifully. We have it in painted and we also produce it in solid color form, but we're really, really excited to be using a fiber that is so abundantly available and to be able to not contribute even more to the plastics in the world. Over the next few years, we're going to focus on experimenting with new blends, making new yarns, and creating more knitwear and woven apparel under the Legacy Lane brand. We're also going to complete the circle by finishing renovations on our farmhouse so that we can offer exclusive fiber-related retreats and share our land with others. Thanks so much to the Fruity Knitting Podcast for having us on the show. Thank you. Recently, when Madeline and I were in Canada, we had a really great trip driving down to Sussex in New Brunswick to visit the Legacy Lane girls. They have a really beautiful yarn store. You saw some photos of the yarn store right at the end of the interview. So the yarn store is in the main street of Sussex and their spinning mill is on the outskirts of Sussex. So if you're in the area, you can go and visit both and get to know their business in person. Now, 
During the interview, they talked about their pop bottle sock yarn, and I've got a skein of it here, as you can see in some of my favorite colors. It's very colorful. This colorway is called Mermaid. I found that so interesting. They use use plastic bottles to to make, make the, the yarn yeah. stor stronger, and yeah. it's, it's still so soft. I didn't expect that from yeah. the story they told. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It's incredibly soft and silky. And it's so interesting to see the fiber that um, the pot bottles are made into. It actually looks like a brown merino. Merino or something. Yeah. Yes. It's really funny to see that. Yeah. So I'm actually look. I don't normally enjoy knitting socks, but I am really looking forward to getting these knitted up and wearing them. Do you knit socks? I haven't. Oh, <laughs> I haven't knitted a sock in my life. My mother knits my socks. <laughs> Sorry oh, to cool. say. That's cool. So you're not going to be knitting any sock patterns soon? Designing? No, 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 no. I yeah. don't think so. Okay. Because you can't see them, can you? I always wear boots. Yeah. And I would, if I would design them, I would like fancy socks, and yeah. that would be a waste of time and energy exactly. for me. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's my philosophy because I like to show off my knits all the time. And me too. Them, and you can't in your boots, but they are hand knitted socks. Are so fantastic. So. Hopefully I will get this knitted up and get to wear them. Now, Legacy Lane Fiber Mill is kindly offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 15% discount off everything in their online store. So apart from their yarn, which comes in many different weights, including Aran, Lopi, DK, Sport, Worsted and Fingering, that's a lot. <laughs> they also have ready-made knitwear and crafting tools and notions. So thank you so much to the Legacy Lane Fiber Mill. So I'd like to remind our viewers that producing fruity knitting is Madeline and my full-time job and we're entirely dependent on the financial support of patrons to keep producing the show. That's because we don't sell anything and we also don't receive money for advertising or sponsorship. So we do ask if you are watching Fruity Knitting to please support our work by becoming a patron. And that is easy and flexible to do and you can pick your own level of support. So thank you so much for doing that and a huge thank you to all the wonderful patrons who have kept Fruity Knitting going so far. Now we're up to knitwear related photography and some of your tips. Okay, um, well, let's start with uh, telling what I think knitwear related photography is. I see it as a crossover between product and fashion photography because we all like to see the colors and the details mm. but we also enjoy looking at pictures that are reflect a certain mood a feeling or a style to take a good picture you have to take a few things into account I think lighting is is really crucial yeah. but a picture will also look a lot better if you have considered a little bit the composition the background and as I, said be, uh, as I said before, I'm a big fan and big advocate of editing, but I will tell you tell more about that later. Well, let's start about the light. There are still a lot of people that think they have to take their, um, uh, their finished object out on a bright sunny day and take pictures in the sunshine. Actually, they could not be more wrong because mm. the light on a bright sunny day is what we call hard light and hard light produces hard shadows. Yeah. So you will have very dark areas on that beautiful sweater and very overexposed areas on that beautiful sweater. And that is just distracting and it obscures all detail. If you look at this picture, for instance, you can clearly see the overexposed areas in the knitwear where all detail is lost. Also, my face is very, very patchy due to the shadows of the leaves, which I find quite distracting. This picture has the same problem to a mm, slightly lower degree. Because it is shot in direct br bright sunlight, there are very dark, deep shadows and very light areas on that Naruda shawl, which does absolutely nothing for showing off the intricate twisted stitch patterning. The easiest light to take your pictures in is what we call soft light. That is the light you get when it's a cloudy day or when you have a whole lot of professional photographic equipment. Most of us don't have and that. people holding screens. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Most of us don't have that. So to shoot, shoot in soft light is way to go because it produces soft shadows and the colors will be as true to life as you can get. For instance, 
This is also the Neruda shawl, shot on a cloudy day at the beach. Because it's, the light is filtered by the clouds, reflected by the water and the sand, it's like shooting in a giant light box. And you see the soft light is coming from all sides. So the, sh the shadows are very soft and even, and you can see all that detail and patterning on the shawl very well. Also, I think the blue of my coat is quite true to life. If this was shot in a harder light, it would have probably looked black. So, if you want to show off your colors and don't have a giant light box, most of us don't, uh, then front light is the way to go. And front light is, the word says it, the light coming from the front of your subject. So the shadows will be behind the subject. Yeah. So the subject, for instance, that beautiful color work sweater will be evenly lit. There will be no shadows and the colors will be as true to life as you can get. Here, I'm wearing my fan sweater my Lune shawl and my Niobe hat, and I'm standing in front of a store window. As you can see, the light is coming from the front of me, and you can see there are no shadows on me. Since that window is further in the background, the area of the picture is darker, so you get a very nice depth of field, and the subject, which, which is you, yeah, <laughs> which happens to be me, <laughs> is what is catching the viewer's eyes first. The colors are very true to life, and you can even distinguish between the different shades of blue of my jeans, the sweater and the shawl. Yeah, that's a fantastic photo. <laughs> Thank you. Well, the downside of front light is it will flatten everything yeah. because there are no shadows. So if you have that beautiful textural cabled sweater, front light is not the best light to shoot it. What you would use is side light, light coming from the side will have the deeper areas in the shadows yeah. and the beautiful cable, which would be higher, would be catching the light. So it will be very, very visible and textural on your picture too. In this picture of my Banta sweater, for instance, you can see the light is coming from the right hand side because that was where the window was. This is what makes the cables pop. Shot with light coming from the front, those cables would look a lot less textured than they do now. To use side lighting in your home is easy. This is in my home. You just make sure your subject is in a 90 degree angle, angle from the window and not too far away from it. The light coming from the window should not be glaring sunlight like we talked about before, but a nice even light. And that way you will get yourself some perfect side lighting to shoot your beautiful cables or textured sweater. Uh, something else about the light you ne need to take in consideration when you're taking your photo is the color of the light. We have warm light, that's the light you get during golden hour in summer. That's my favorite light. Yeah, <laughs> it's very yellowish and warm. And we have the cooler light, that is what you get on a crispy winter's day and that leans more to a bluish Blue, light. Yeah. And the colors of that light will change the colors of your picture and the colors of your knit. So you can, um, you can correct that to a certain degree when you edit your picture, but it will only go so far without looking fake. So it's better to take it into account when you're shooting your picture. For instance, these are two unedited pictures of my Morgana shawl. They were taken only 10 minutes apart, That's I think. That's incredible, 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Yeah. How much the light can change in 10 minutes. And you can see how dramatically the color of the light changes the color of the shawl as well. It's, it's far yellower and goldener. So in my opinion, the best light to shoot colors is a neutral, almost grayish light. But in some instances, a warm light can be used for the warmer, the earthier tones. To, to bring out that earthiness. That goldenness, that's what I like. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, but if you use that warm light for cooler colors like the blues, the purples, the white, it will all go all murky and yellowish. So yeah. that's not and a good muddy look. muddy looking. Yeah. yeah. And when you use, and the cooler light is actually good for cooler colors because it brings out that, those vibrant tones and makes it all look fresh and crispy. So that was a little on light which is really crucial, and then background and composition. I could, could talk for hours about that because a good composition grabs the viewer's eyes and leads the gaze to exactly the thing you want to show. There are a few classical ways to do that. 
For instance, leading lines is one of them, which means that, are, that there are lines in a picture that leads the viewer's gaze to the subject. You can see in this picture of my Lune, the bridge railings are the leading lines towards the shawl. Another classic is following the rule of thirds. Um, this is very pleasant on the viewer's eye. And for this composition, you divide the frame in three equal parts, horizontally as well as vertically. And then you place the most important elements of that picture on the axis and the intersections of those lines. If you look at this picture of me and my social, you see my body is on one of the axes and the hand that is holding the shawl is on one of the intersections of those yeah, lines. It's interesting. Yeah, and it's very comfortable on on the viewer's eye. Yeah, it yeah. has a natural balance. Exactly, exactly. Another great way to focus the viewer's eye on the subject is a centered composition. Quite easy to do, and as you can see, it's quite striking and also leads the gaze to where you want it to go. I think this picture of me wearing my Yara shawl is a very good example of that. Okay, so the most important advice I have on uh, composition and background is to consider everything in the frame. Because I see a lot of pictures in Un Revelry and also um, on Instagram that have what I think is unwanted clutter. Yeah. Like overflowing tr trash cans in the background, lampposts growing out of models' head. Yeah. And to get around that, of course, you want to. Um, you want to focus on that subject, on that sweater, on that model, but before you press that, uh, press that shutter, consider everything in the frame, also what is in the background, not only your subject. That's that, that will lead to a beautiful picture. Totally. Sometimes we've had our pot plants, our flowers growing out, either my or Madeline's <laughs> head, so I know all about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, then I'm going to say something about editing. And people, editing is not cheating. The picture that comes out of your camera or out of your phone is not reality. Mm -hmm. It's the device's interpretation of the reality. Good editing is not about making someone look like, like Kim Kardashian or um, filtering a picture into oblivion, but get as close as you can to the results you would, ha would have when you have the best equipment, the best light, and the best photographer. Yeah. And really, you don't need that much for it. Often straightening the lines and correcting the saturation and the exposure a bit will make the picture a lot better. I mean, a lousy one will never be a good one, but after you've done those steps, those few steps, it will be better. I much promise. better. Yeah. Yes. Compare, for instance, the before and the after of the Morgana shawl picture. The edited version landed on the cover of a Dutch crafting magazine. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm quite sure that would not have happened if I had sent them the unedited version. No Probably way. not. <laughs> it makes us feel really good when we see your unedited versions. <laughs> well, the most important editing steps I took were to straighten the lines, which means that you rotate the picture until the most important horizontal or vertical lines are straight, like those stairs and not as in the unedited version askew. I made it a little more contrasty, so I upped the contrast, which makes the darker areas like my coat darker and the lighter areas like the shawl a little lighter. And I upped the saturation just a little, which means put a little more color in it, so those reds really pop. After that, I crop the picture to get a nice composition. And what I really like about this picture is that distinct line on the left side, the railing, because that leads the viewer's gaze upwards over the entire shawl. Yeah, it's ended up a beautiful picture, a really successful picture. Thank you. These are all editing steps you can do with the editing tool that comes within Instagram. So, and when you use them, you will see it will improve your picture yeah. a lot. I went, went a little further because I mostly use Photoshop for my editing and Photoshop gives you the opportunity to edit certain elements in your picture. Maybe you've seen that I also darkened and blurred the background of that Morgana picture a bit to make that shawl pop extra, you know? That's a great effect. Yeah, it is a great effect. 
You cannot do that in, an in, in the Instagram app, but there is a very powerful free app and it's called Snapseed and that allows you to, uh, to spot edit. I mean, most people don't have or need Photoshop, but if you like editing, you might want to look into that Snapseed app because it's fun. Yeah, Natasha showed it to me the other night and we had a lot of fun just taking very crappy photos and <laughs> making them beautiful or <laughs> better. Better. But it's amazing what you can do. Yeah, it's very powerful. Yeah, yeah, it's great. Okay, so the interview that Natasha and I did back in June is coming up next. And somebody said that Natasha designs whispering sweaters and screaming shawls. That's such a lovely poetic description, even if it is slightly <laughs> exaggerated. Slightly. <laughs> I'm definitely going to be knitting up at least two of the designs that you'll see very shortly in the interview, and I'm sure some of you will be inspired to do it as well. So we're going to start a new knit along, and we'll call it the Moonstruck Carl, which is a great name for a knit along. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. <laughs> So as usual, that'll be held over in the Fruity Knitting Ravelry Group and the Patron Community Forum. And Natasha is very kindly offering Fruity Knitting patrons a 25% discount of all her self-published designs from her Ravelry store. So have a wonderful time browsing through all her portfolio. So one of the things I most enjoy about editing is matching the music to the content that I've filmed, or in the case of interview guests, matching the music to the interview guest. <laughs> and at first it was rather difficult for me to find suitable music for Natasha because in my mind, and I'm really going to embarrass you now, <laughs> Natasha is one of the naturally sexiest people I oh know. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and as you probably all realise by now, my favourite genre is classical music, but I am also partial to a little bit of Van Morrison. So, and I think Moondance is one of Van Morrison's most sensuous songs. So after a little Moondance, you're all going to be in the mood to be moonstruck by Natasha's knits. <laughs> <laughs> Thoroughly embarrassed. Ah, uh, but also so lovely. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so we'll say goodbye from Offenbach and we'll see you very soon in Amsterdam. Bye. Bye. It's a marvelous night for a moon dance With the stars up above in your eyes A fantabulous night to make romance Neat the cover of October skies You know the leaves on the trees are falling To the sound of the breezes that blow You know I'm trying to please to the calling Of your heartstrings that play soft and low You know the night Seem to whisper and hush And you know, all the soft moonlight seems to shine In your blush Can I just have one more moon dance with you oh, My love Can I just make some more romance with you oh, My love Welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm in the beautiful city of Amsterdam with the knitwear designer Natasha Hornby. Natasha has been on Fruity Knitting twice already, once as a knitter of the world and then again in our new releases segment. She's a relatively new hand knitting designer, but in my opinion, her designs just keep getting better and better. They're very sophisticated, elegant and exciting. Oh, thank you. <laughs> And I think if you don't already know Natasha's work, you will definitely enjoy following along as she goes. And I am just thrilled that she's now agreed to do a full feature interview with Fruity Knitting. So thank you so much for inviting us into your home. Well, thank you so much for having me again. <laughs> I feel like Fruity Knitting is a part of my knitting career. Oh, that's now. good. That's yeah. good. So for our worldwide viewers, can you just describe where you live here and... Tell us some of the things that you most enjoy about the local culture. Well, as you said, this is the beautiful city of Amsterdam and um, I've been living here for over 30 years now. And uh, what I love about my city and, and its culture is that it is made up of a lot of cultures, great variety of people, but also like the layout of the inner city is very 
can feel very intimate and human scale. And at the same time, it has everything a larger city has. So the beautiful shops, um, the nice uh, museums, the galleries, uh, the restaurants, um, the terraces. I enjoy everything enormously. Yes. Yeah, and the bicycles everywhere. Of course, of course. <laughs> Yesterday, we Natasha took me around the centre of Amsterdam and we had a lovely wine, sipping wine outside <laughs> our fresco, watching the, the bicycles drive by. It was really, really beautiful. So before you have a look at Natasha's designs, I'd just like you to hear a little bit about her background because when she was 17, she went to college to train as a teacher for handcrafts, fashion and textiles. And at the same time, she was supporting herself by making clothes for independent boutiques here in Amsterdam. That just sounds like such a creative time in your life. So tell us a bit about that. Yeah, well, it was a really creative time, but I think also the time before that, because I was I, I started making things at a very, very young age. Yeah. And um, I was always interested in anything to do with textiles. So not only um, sewing or, or knitting, but also macrame, weaving, crocheting. And um, I knitted my first sweater when I was, was about eight years old. And my both my parents are avid makers. My mom also is very much into anything textile. My dad does a lot of woodwork and metal work. So I think I naturally picked up that desire to make things from them. So when I needed to choose um, uh, education geared towards future career, um, it to me it was logical. It had to do something with uh, designing or textiles. And at the time when I was 17, it seemed a lot more sensible to go to a teacher's college than, for instance, um, um, art school. So what I learned there was um, the more technical aspects of, of making, um, making clothes and um, especially like uh, the grading, but also pattern, um, um, pattern drawing. But I also learned how to design. Um, which means that you must have a concept, you must know what you want to communicate and also how to communicate it. Okay. And also, yeah. you have to be really prepared to kill some very precious darlings if it doesn't fit into the concept. Yeah. Okay, so you can't be too precious about something that's yours. No, yeah. edit things out. Yeah, okay. And you were, so you were doing that to support yourself to independent boutiques weren't you also, just making yes. different clothes and things and yes. you were also into costumes <laughs> right into yes, costumes so yes. tell us a bit about that and also you mentioned to me that your graduation collection that sounded really interesting so I'd like the audience to mm -hmm. hear about that yeah I, I graduated from college with a, a collection based on fairy tales because mm -hmm. I really and still do really like archetypical figures and archetypical uh, uh, personalities so I based my collection on the archetypical stepmother, the princess, the prince and the gnome. And um, I made all those, uh, those outfits and also used very couture-like finishing techniques. So it's not only nice looking, but also technically sound, because I think that is quite important. And um, yeah, that fascination went into the costumes I made for the costume parties and especially the headdresses. I went all wild with all kinds of materials and all kinds of techniques to, well, you had to wear them on your head for about, head for about four hours. So oh, wow. It had to be doable. That sounds so exciting. I would love to have been there with you in your <laughs> 20s going to your parties. It was kind of wild, <laughs> but good. Yeah. So I'm going to be putting some photos up here so you can get a, a, an idea of what she's done there. Okay, so what did you, uh, what are some of the things that you learned in your fashion and textile studies that helped you solve design problems later on in hand knitting? Well, there, there, is, there are similarities and differences between hand knitting and uh, making, uh, making clothes from fabric. Um, a big uh, a difference is that with a fabric, you start with a two-dimensional thing, the piece of fabric, and then you cut it in a certain way and you use seams and, and darts to mold the piece. Mm -hmm. What is really, you can do that with hand knitting as yeah. well, just yeah. um, knit four pieces and sew them together. But uh, what I find interesting in hand knitting is that you can work three dimensionally right away. So um, that is a difference. And also hand knitting is a bit more forgiving yeah. fit wise yeah. because you work with a fabric that stretches lengthwise and, and width wise. Yeah. So it doesn't have to be like millimeter precise. Yeah. 
Uh, but of course, there are a lot of similarities as well because, yeah, it's the human form you want to cover. Mm -hmm. So I still use things I've learned there to get a good fit, especially around the yoke. Because I think for, for hand knitting and a sweater, the yoke is the more, most important part. It's, it's here where you need to um, solve the problems with the increases or the decreases, depending on how you work. Mm -hmm. And also with the stitch patterns and also the whole thing below uh, the underarm, you can quite easily adjust. Yeah. But it has to fit here. Yeah. So you've got quite interesting shaping with your raglan shaping. Yeah. Tell us more about that. Yeah, because uh, um, ordinarily, standardly, a, a raglan, you will increase every second row mm -hmm. on both the, the sleeve and the body side. Mm -hmm. This can lead to potential fit problems, especially in the larger sizes, because you just don't have enough... Uh, a depth or uh, mm -hmm. to to increase all those body stitches. Mm -hmm. um, a solution is to do a compound raglan and increase at different intervals. Not every uh, second round or row, one stitch everywhere. But for instance, here you will increase quite a lot on both shoulders and body. And then when you get straighter over here, you increase less on the body, more on the sleeves. And over here, you increase, again, a lot uh, for both body and sleeve. Yeah. So you get that, that line of the satin sleeve. You mimic that line. Yeah. So the rag line will look a lot nicer, and it will be even, this, this curved line yeah. will be even more pronounced for the larger sizes. Okay. So for you, it's been really helpful to know how to draft patterns so that you can scale things up, but yes. still make things look really, really good. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And when I when I have problems, I still I still um, draw the the patterns on paper, and then I measure everything out and see how it works with my gauge and see how how to get there to that okay. good fit. Yeah. Um, and I mean, this is a raglan, but it goes for for all kinds of shoulder or yoke solutions. For instance, over here, we have a, a drop shoulder sweater. I'll hold it for you. Thank you. And you can do the pointing. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, drop shoulder has been very popular lately because it has a, a relaxed, laid back look, mm. but it can also have problems. Mm -hmm. Because if you have a classical drop shoulder, you will, in fact, knit or have four pieces of red rectangular fabric. Yes. Sew them together. Okay, there's your drop shoulder. So, in fact, you have something two-dimensional, T-shaped. Yeah. I'm not two-dimensional in yeah. T-shaped, nor are you. And you get a whole lot of bulky and bits you get, where you don't want them. Exactly. <laughs> so, I wanted that laid-back mm -hmm. uh, look, and it's also quite heavy yarn, so yeah. I did not want that bulk yeah. here. Yeah. So, what I did was uh, do a modified raglan, and for a modified raglan, you do cast on for the underarm yeah. over here, so you make it more three-dimensional okay. and spanning the yeah. body and what I also did was these ribs here these are short rows so ah. there's a banana shaped piece in here okay so there's a very slight cap. exactly yeah so the sleeve hat will also fit better around yeah. your, your shoulder yeah so that's all your tailoring techniques getting exactly. snaggly <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Okay. Now, what about this one? Because that's definitely yeah. different. <laughs> yeah. Is that a dolman? You'd call this a dolman. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. this, all these examples uh, are derived from that, that classical setting yeah. sleeve. Yeah. Uh, worked in a slightly different way to yeah. get shaping. But sometimes you do something weird. <laughs> I'm working on this design at the moment. <laughs> so I wanted this yoke shape for the patterning because this is all very compelling and very rhythmic and mm. you cannot do a lot here mm -hmm. if you want the pattern to look like this. Mm -hmm. So I constructed the sweater by um, only increasing here and here. So the whole yoke, if you um, if the, the body is not there yet or the sleeves are not there, you have a, a, a square piece of fabric yes. with a hole in it yes. <laughs> and then you double that up and then you start short rowing the body and the sleeves, the, the, the stockinette portion in. So this 
uh, construction was quite popular in the 80s as well. Mm -hmm. There were, are a lot of uh, sweaters that were constructed this way. Some of them have this point on the front yeah, and yeah. pointy sleeves and you know, yeah. looking really cute. And, <laughs> cute and which like. Uh, <laughs> but I didn't want it. I wanted this construction because I thought it was cute. But I didn't want points and I did not want, because a lot of them have not dolman sleeves, but huge yes. back wing sleeves. Yeah, yeah. Because if you separate your body and sleeve stitches here, you will have enormous lot of sleeve stitches. All of these mm -hmm. are sleeve stitches. Mm -hmm. So that if you if you use all of them to to uh, construct that sleeve, the sleeve will be massive. And I didn't want that because I don't make massive sweaters. <laughs> so what I did here was decreasing um, severely. And yes. I, I think even on both sides, double decrease almost every second row yeah. or something. So you take all out all of this fabric, stay close to the, the patterning, which is mm -hmm. also nice, not have this enormous mm -hmm. portion of net over here. And uh, this is how I solved the, this puzzle. Yes, so far I've knitted down here and I'm yet to do this section on the <laughs> sleeves. I'm looking forward to it. Okay, now you have said that you enjoy experimenting with the appearance of, of a design by changing the directions of different elements within the design. Yeah. So we want to know more about that and show us some examples where you've done that. Yes, the horizontals, verticals, diagonals and the way they morph into each other, that is what keeps me awake at night. That is what, what I think about when I'm, <laughs> when I'm designing and I'm, when I'm thinking about a concept of a sweater. And um, ordinarily in hand knitting, color work will be horizontally oriented. Mm -hmm. I mean, stripes yeah. or um, stranded little shapes. Yeah, yeah. Um, cables will be oriented vertically. Um, and also, um, there are um, um, stockinette, for instance, uh, is very flat, but if you do a garter, also oriented yeah. horizontally. Yeah. If you play with those notions, and if you approach your knitting from a different direction, it can be visually very exciting and appealing. And, and I always think, when I think of a sweater, I always think of top down in the round first, because I like top down in the round. A lot of people like top down in the round. But if the idea of the sweater is not doable, top down yeah. in the round, I don't throw away the idea. Good, good. <laughs> The concept for yeah. me is very important. And I'm looking at your jumper because this fits in with this question. <laughs> exactly. So I, I, then I try to find other um, uh, um, ways to solve that puzzle. That, that yeah. keeps me awake at night. So, for instance, this one is a quite, quite an extreme um, example of that. It was based on like the folk costumes you see in many, many cultures with the uh, with the patent or the embroidered front, the simpler sides and um, a bit of a defined waist. And I wanted to make something, I, I was thinking about how to, to, to get close to that concept, still be modern and still be, uh, yeah. You've done relevant. that very well because you can see it's got a vague folky influence, but it's not folky. Yeah, yeah, well, <laughs> thank you. That was what I was trying to achieve, so yeah. I'm happy that it looks that way. So what I did was do this front panel first in a simple mosaic, um, but I wanted that uh, front panel, be fra uh, frame that front panel with like ribbon-like uh, uh, yeah. uh, uh, shapes or yeah. ribbon-like uh, framing. And so I did want to use the same shape but tilted. So I needed to work this on the bias. Ah. So this is started over here with a few stitches. Then mm -hmm. you work up here, increasing, 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 decreasing down there. And you get the X shapes. Then you pick up from here, work in the ordinary direction, and the same shapes become pluses. Yeah. And over here as well. So after I finish that one, then you have these two panels. We turn I it around. Turn around. I knit at the back. Very simple. Blop. And <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's stuck again. Yeah. And then I picked up stitches over here. Mm -hmm. 
cast on for the neckline, picked up stitches over there. So then I was working sideways, yeah. which g gave me the opportunity for the weld, which yes. is very good for the structure, yes. also decorative. And the framing. Exactly. Yeah. And also for some very simple vertical color work again. <laughs> working it this way. This is so striking. <laughs> I love the look of it, but when you explain it, it's even more exciting. <laughs> and then down here, yeah. you've got a... W a w Once this was all finished, I picked up here, and then I knitted this waistband, or yeah, the waistband, in a, a basket weave stitch, because I think that, that echoes the shapes mm -hmm. of the mosaic mm -hmm. very well. So I'm quite that. extreme <laughs> example it's, of... It's totally gorgeous. Changing directions. Okay, so what else? Yeah, this is another one. Mm -hmm. For this one, you start with two strips. These two. Okay. Oh, okay, on the sleeve. On the sleeve. Yeah. The, the cabled strips. Yeah. So you're, you're knitting long, long, long cabled strips, two, two of them. Then you pick up all the stitches over here. Mm -hmm and over there, mm -hmm. and then you short row the body in. Okay. Also to get, not working straight, because that would would harm the fit, the fit wouldn't be so good, but you short row it in yeah. to get this shape. When you get down to here, and you do the same on the back, of course, yeah. then you go in around. Okay, and you do the, the uh, shaping, waist shaping down Yes, there, exactly. Down. And after that, I picked up on the sleeves and knitted down yes because that way you you've can, got two di directions there exactly and you can you can adjust the the length of your sleeve more easily yes because if you have to do if this has to be a good length all over from here to here yeah but uh, yeah shady <laughs> exactly that's that's really that's really well thought out yeah and because you have um horizontal oriented um um garter for instance here and vertically here and for the cables oh, the other yes. way around yeah vertically here yeah and horizontal there yes it's um i think it's visually very interesting it is it is <laughs> and it's all kind of tied together because it's still neutral in in the overall look of the yarn and everything that's beautiful very exciting yes and I also use that whole modular approach for my shawls. Okay. This one, for instance, I've shown you that one. <laughs> oh, yes. This is, a, this is a great example of directions going all over the place. <laughs> uh, this is my Lune shawl. I'll just move this. And I wanted the, the um, color work, which is mosaic. I wanted to... That, Should that. we hold it in a, in a half like that? Yeah, yeah, it's good. I wanted that to appear horizontally and, and vertically again mm -hmm. because I think that looks nice. So I started here with a few stitches, increasing and doing the color work here, decreasing up there, up to, to the other um, upper edge, and then picking up stitches and working down. So you have this vertical and horizontally mm -hmm. oriented color work which looks nice Just in my stunning. opinion. It looks absolutely stunning. It's very beautiful. Thank you. <laughs> so what's the relationship for you between uh, gauge and stitch pattern when you're designing? So, for example, what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of the different gauges when you're trying to maybe match them with a stitch pattern that you're interested in using? Well, you're saying advantages and disadvantages. I don't think about it in that way. Okay. I think you need to make use of the properties every yarn yeah. has. And um, a thinner yarn and a smaller gauge means more stitches per inch, so you can be much more subtle with your patterning and also with your shaping. The thicker the yarn, the grander the gesture. Mm -hmm. um, so I think these, for instance, show that off quite well because I knitted the shawl um, uh, in the same yarn I used for the hat, but for the hat, I held the yarn double. Mm -hmm. So you can see the shapes are more pronounced and larger and also the garter ridges sticking out a lot more when you have yeah, the, yeah. the yarn double. You see that? Yeah. And for a shawl you would probably use um, thinner needles compared to the yarn you're mm -hmm. using because you want drape and yeah. you don't want it to stand up like a stiff, know, yeah. stiff thing yeah. around you. And for a hat you want it to be warm and windproof and yes. stuff like that. So you will use a smaller needle compared to the yarn. Yeah. 
And I play also with gauge and the notion of, of shaping shapes and patterning uh, with this one, for instance, because this is a very, very intricate lace. Mm -hmm. And usually you will see this done in a, quite a thin yarn, um, which gives it a very delicate, girly quality. Yeah. But done in, in a DK, quite rounded, quite heavy weight yeah. yarn for the patterning, it almost seems knotted. So the whole girly vibe goes mm. away. And yeah. I really like that for this, uh, this show. Yeah. So just going off the question a bit, you have combined lace with some slip stitches here. Yes. And some braiding. Yes. That's looking great. And it's also a very... Um, uh, funny construction. Okay, tell me about the construction. <laughs> yeah, as usual, almost. Because I wanted to have that scalloped edge. There was no way around than to to start here with the uh -huh. with the yeah. with the cast on. And then I I um, knitted the lace up mm -hmm. until here, and then I knitted it up until there. And see, you don't have that scalloped edge over there. Oh, slightly yeah. scalloped. And then you have live stitches over here, and I picked up these, and then I did the inner portion. Again, the changing of the direction. Yes, which, which everything like of yours lot. looks <laughs> patterns in different directions. That sort of, they're very harmonious, but they still show different sections, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so you've used a, a lace pattern here, which could be done delicately. You've done it sort of in a more chunky, bold, casual way. Yeah. Yeah. I like it because yeah, this this feels like you can wear it with your all worn in jeans, and yeah. you don't have to be all. So when you're designing, are you thinking immediately? This is the concept I want. Yes. Okay. Not immediately. It takes a lot of iterations. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> but you're thinking this is the concept. I'm wanting a casual look that's chunky and maybe a bit sexy, or I'm looking for something delicate. Yes. That comes yes. right at the beginning. Yes, yeah. that comes right at the beginning. Yeah. Okay. And then the silhouette and. Uh, Very good. Now, when you did first start designing, you were really heavily focused on sweaters. I was. And then over time, because I remember at the Edinburgh Yarn Festival, you say, now I'm a sweater knitter. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but over time, you've grown to love shawls mm -hmm. and see them as a way to express more adventurous combinations of colour and pattern. So we need to see some of these statement shawls. <laughs> and we've got one here. Yeah. Well, as a shorter person, I thought I would... I, I didn't see the appeal of shawls. A, a large piece of flat fabric wrapping that around me in a remotely elegant way. I, 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 I didn't see myself doing that. And um, to be honest, I started, uh, started with designing a shawl because I didn't have any inspiration for a sweater. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So I said I thought, well, let's give that flat piece of fabric a go and see what I can do. So I did one and I was that was quite held back. And then I did a second one, which was my man. And I was hooked. <laughs> <laughs> because with a shawl I feel so much freer. I don't have to worry about fit and I can do all kinds of crazy stuff like like grand scale color work also for my aunt i use these huge flowers and also yeah. the repet repetitions and a crazy edging and thinking of morphing one stitch pattern into another one with like with this one the corvus this was yes this is this, this is, came before the sweater yeah <laughs> And I wanted to use that basket weave, and but then I want to, wanted the shapes to open up. And you, you, because it's so rhythmic, you cannot do that because, and I needed to um, make this, this shape myself, design the, the cable shape myself to let it flow throughout the design. And I finished this with, with a little, um, how do you call them? Tassels? Oh, tassels. tassels. Yes. Because the, again, they reflect the shape of the of the yeah. um, so cable this pattern. is not a stitch pattern that you've picked up. You've no. made this up yourself, yeah. which is great because it does flow naturally out of the basket weave, doesn't it? Yeah, and yeah, well, I, that is why I love shawls now, and also my shawls. Um, if you if you look at this one, also uses a lot of lot of different stitch patterns. Uh, I wouldn't do that for a sweater. As someone once told me, you design 
what did she say? Whispering sweaters and screaming shawls. <laughs> that is so cool. I'm not sure I agree anymore. No, I wouldn't my, say my, your sweaters no, are whispering. My sweaters are that. Yeah, my sweaters <laughs> are not that quiet anymore. But um, it gives me inspiration for the sweaters as well. And sometimes in a very subtle way, but sometimes very obvious. So the, the stitch pattern I used for the cardigan I showed you earlier, um, I first did that on my, yes. on my Yara shawl. And also that cardigan has mosaic sleeves, which I use for a lot of shawls. And uh, the Corbus sweater you are yeah. knitting um, was directly derived from the shawl yes. because I finished this and I thought this will be, I want this around, I want this three dimensional around my body. A body. <laughs> so, um, yeah, the shawls are very inspirational to me. And also with the, with the designing and the knitting came the wearing mm -hmm. because um, when I go out and I wrap myself in them, I feel like I have, they're all large, so I have presence and substance. And, but at the same time, they really shield me, like almost like a superhero cloak or something. <laughs> Back to your costume. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, and I think they tie an outfit together like no other piece of uh, accessory can. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, which actually leads me on to the next question because as a self-published um, designer, imaging is really, really crucial and yeah. that includes the photography and how you style the garment for the photo shoot, which you do very, very well. But for you, it's also really important what gar what color you show the garment in in the in the initial photo shoot so why is that yeah well i am as a person who has worn all black for a lot of years <laughs> in succession i come well, you were gothic <laughs> <laughs> yes um, i don't consider myself a, a, a color color expert um i do wear color now but i tend to gravitate towards the more muted mm -hmm. and the more great downtones and so i use them for the designs as well not only because it's my personal preference mm. but i think in a more um a, a more muted color or a more gray down color it's easier for the onlooker to project their own ideas and yes. their own aesthetic i mean we all have colors we yeah. despise don't yeah, we yeah. that will make us look away however beautiful the design mm. is mm. so um I think a, a porridge or <laughs> a grayish color uh, will not bring that much excitement, but it will show off the stitch patterns very well and the silhouette and uh, things like that. And yeah, well, it also looks good if, uh, in, in, in pictures because you said imaging is very important and dark colors, for instance, are very hard to take good pictures of yeah. as uh, uh, loud reds, for instance, are also notoriously hard to photo. Right, photograph. I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, if I know everybody is looking at you <laughs> and saying, "What is she wearing?" And or you would might describe this as porridge, but to me, it is incredibly <laughs> elegant. So, just tell us briefly about what you're wearing. It's actually it's a bit of a spoiler little secret it came off the blocking mats yesterday it does not have a name but i'm moving in this direction uh, yeah. for the months to come pattern is only bare bones but uh, we're getting there and it actually comprises a lot of things that we've talked about exactly because you've got sideways knitting i can see yes across start, the top here, here and, yeah. then, and there here is a very bit interesting of, uh, short rowing shaping to, to get the shape right. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. it's very exciting. And I was thinking about embroidery doing this one. Yeah. So. This is on my list to knit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going to finish off the interview very soon. But first of all, I've got two quick questions. I'd like to hear a little bit about your mother because mm. I think she's done some sample knitting for you. You've it, it described her as a very meticulous knitter and I've seen you both together at the Edinburgh Yarn yes. Festival. So how has she inspired you or influenced you with your knitting and designing? Well, my mom, uh, of course, taught me how to knit when I was four years old and she had my back when I knitted my first sweater when I was eight years old. Um, and after that, of course, I stopped knitting for a long, long time. So I picked it up again in my late 40s um, because of a, uh, I had a burnout situation. So I couldn't leave the house. I was crying all the time. 
and I needed something to make something again and preferably something soft and cuddly and to, to feel good. So I picked up the knitting again and uh, my mom and me both together we discovered Ravelry because she picked it up also and we learned to knit from patterns because we didn't do that before. And I distinctly remember as we were trying to swatch for uh, Hoki's dragonfly sweater, okay. which oh, was yeah. charted, and we didn't know how to rechart. So we were sitting opposite of each other, chanting, slip, slip, knit, uh, pearl one, knit one, yarn over, slip, slip, knit. <laughs> <laughs> so that is how we both um, uh, developed ourselves again in the knitting. Uh, which was fun. And then when I started to design, um, she also tested for me. But um, my mother is a prolific knitter. She's a far better knitter than I am. But she's not such a <coughs> good tester. Sorry, mom. <laughs> not such a good tester. Why uh, is that? Mm, well, uh, she's so experienced and so used to not working from a pattern that she will glance over every mistake and just do and it how it it's supposed to be done. Yeah, she'll think, so, okay, I'll do this. Or, does she does she find new ways of doing things? Is of she, course. Has she shown you things that you've incorporated in? Mm, yeah, well, she does, new, but I don't know. We do that. She taught me how to, to cast on, and I still cast on in a really weird way. I, I do it like this instead of like this. And it took me about, I don't know, four years to find out that I'm doing it. In a, in a weird way. <laughs> in a weird way. And I have to, uh, I have to, also when I'm writing my patterns, I have to compensate for that. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so, okay. So mum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. And now the other thing is that Natasha has started to, well, she's planned a knitting retreat for next year, which sounds very exciting. So let's finish off the interview by telling us a little bit about that. Yes, well, the retreat, uh, it, it's a dream of mine because, and the retreat will be held, uh, I'm organizing it now, and uh, the retreat, retreat will be held in Tessel, which is a very small, lovely little island in the northwest of the Netherlands. And uh, I grew up there and my parents had a hotel. So I'm very uh, used to um, uh, taking care of people and the hospitality. I was working in the hotel from, I think, age 10. So I really feel like I'm coming to some kind of circle with this retreat because first there was a hotel with my parents, then um, then came the teaching and after that the knitting and it would be wonderful to share it with like-minded people and uh, just be there knitting, learning about knitting, talking about knitting in a beautiful surrounding and just enjoying the island to, with with. All of us together. I am sure you will do it with great style, knowing <laughs> you. That's very exciting. Well, look, we have to end here, and I am so thrilled that you've come on Fruity Knitting again because I think you're a fantastic designer. I love your designs. You're one of my new favorite designers, oh, I think. So, so thank sweet. you for spending time with us. Thank you for coming all the way to visit me, Andrea. It was such a pleasure. Good. Pleasure. Thank you very much. Let's say goodbye. Bye. Bye.